This is Moderate Rebels. I'm Ben Norton, joined by my co-host Max Blumenthal. And today we're talking about Joe Biden and how the neoliberal Democratic Party leadership has really forced everyone to unify behind this candidate, Joe Biden, who, first of all, we just have to be honest, is suffering from serious mental problems, serious issues of dementia. But also, as we're going to talk about today, I mean, this guy has an odious history not just in terms of domestic politics with supporting the war on drugs, but also especially internationally with his policies in Latin America, his involvement in Ukraine. So later on in this interview, we're going to be joined by James Carden to talk more about uh, the Biden's links to Ukraine and the corruption there. But Max, do you want to talk about Super Tuesday and the results we've seen in which, you know, they're not looking good for Bernie. They actually look pretty good for, for Joe Biden. Yeah. Um, first of all, I hope everyone you know hangs around for um, you know later on in our in this episode because James Carden is someone who actually worked in the State Department, uh, knew Biden's advisors, saw how the sausage was made, and really uh, revolted against what uh, Biden, who really took kind of personal ownership over Ukraine and Eastern Europe, and his team were doing. Um, so I think you know he's a really special guest who can speak to the mentality of the liberal liberal interventionists who are cohering around Biden. Um, you know they really represent the foreign policy wing of the party establishment, what you could fairly call the deep state. Um, and their job basically is to secure the financial interests abroad uh, through companies like Barisma uh, for the political establishment and Wall Street. And, you know, basically all of these hacks who rake in you know, the Atlantic Council, these think tanks that take money from Burisma, uh, we'll talk about that. But, uh, you know, tonight has been a remarkable night in a depressing way. Um, Bernie Sanders was predicted to win California by a two to one margin four days ago. All the signals were showing that he was going to win Massachusetts and Minnesota, where he challenged sitting senators who were in the race uh, against him. And he has lost both states to Joe Biden, someone who had practically no ground game in either of those states and can barely finish a sentence. Um, the <laughs> Oh, and not, not only can he barely finish a sentence, but actually the day before Super Tuesday, Biden gave a speech in which he implored voters, go out and support us on Super Thursday. I mean, Tuesday. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, our friend Jordan Chariton was actually suspended from Twitter for spreading disinformation because he merely quoted Joe Biden's mental glitch. <laughs> so Biden is currently rolling through the southeastern United States like a big wheel through an Alabama cotton field. And that is largely on the strength of older African-American voters and the kind of Democratic Party's old patronage network that's been set up um, at least since the Clinton era in the South, but maybe going all the way back to LBJ. Um, these are states outside of North Carolina and Virginia that Democrats typically don't win in general elections. And it has a lot to do with Biden's connection to Barack Obama. But you've also seen Biden win Minnesota. Um, he won actually in the county that encompasses Minneapolis, which is the most progressive part of Minnesota, where many of the you know, universities and campuses that you would think would go for Bernie, which probably did go for Bernie, are centered. Of course, Klobuchar endorsed Biden, but what we're seeing is a lot of Democrats voting for the status quo, voting for centrism. We saw the supposed kingmaker in South Carolina, Representative James Clyburn, just go on MSNBC and say, people don't want free things. They don't want a revolution. America is already just fine. Um, and this kind of messaging and the support for it from voters, or at least the accession to it, really is what depresses me. And I've been wondering, how are they going to shiv Bernie? Are they going to rig it somehow, you know, some dirty tricks like we might have seen in Iowa? What we're seeing right now is just kind of all these small-time candidates cohering around one dementia-addled dotard uh, <laughs> to advance centrism and force Bernie Sanders out of the race. And, you know, if this is the end result, if they send Joe Biden into a general election, I will have to come to the conclusion that the Democratic Party is completely 
irredeemable that I cannot see it as any possible, you know, any possible vehicle for reform. I mean, I don't see Bernie Sanders as someone who's going to take on the empire or take on capitalism. Anyone who th thinks that is just as big a rube as the kind of like more moderate progressive youth who thought that Barack Obama was going to be a force for hope and change. But Bernie Sanders will bring about needed reforms if he's able to get his agenda through. And the movement behind him is, you know, something that I really, it's filled with many people I identify with and I identify with their, their struggles and their, their pain, which is about, you know, having healthcare, just tearing a hole through your pocket. Um, you know, not being able to move out of your house and have to have, you know, having to have roommates, all kinds of just economic realities people are going through. He speaks to that. And to, you know, to see this, just to see Joe Biden just smother that entire movement of people, to see us go back, not even to 2008, but it really, it's, it almost feels like we're going back to 1992 with this just completely unelectable candidate. Uh, it really, I, I will not do anything supportive of his candidacy. It doesn't matter if he is running against uh, you know, the Ustasha. I don't care that the, it's just unacceptable what was just done. And, um, so that's where, it, where it stands for me. I think a lot of people that, that, sh that would probably resonate with a lot of people who listen to this, but I think, you know, the, the other, the other issue, I mean, we've talked about, we need to talk about, you know, principles where Joe Biden stands, his record, and it's something that, you know, we've been writing about a lot at the gray zone. Um, but we also need to talk about electability. Joe Biden is probably the least electable candidate, in my view, once he gets into the arena with Donald Trump. So, um, I mean, Ben, you followed Joe Biden and his foreign policy record enough. Um, I mean, let, let's, let, let's talk about you know, Joe Biden from the perspective of a voter who actually cares about, you know, anti-war politics. And, and the rest of the world, the other 95% of the planet. Or who cares about, you know, people who live outside of U.S. borders. Yeah, absolutely. Well, first of all, one of the things that we can talk about is Joe Biden's policy in Latin America. And Max published an article at The Gray Zone looking at Joe Biden's role in Plan Colombia and that is a plan going back to the Clinton administration. The Bill Clinton administration claimed that it was going to solve the problem of the insurgency in Colombia. This is, of course, a very right-wing authoritarian country. And the, the U.S., through the CIA specifically, has used Colombia as like the major drug trafficking country for the, for the entire world, really, but especially the region, using Colombia as a vehicle to transit drugs to fund the wars in Central America in the 1980s. So, of course, the, the Contras in Nicaragua were funded by the CIA after actually the Democrats in Congress voted to, to end the funding of the Contras. So the Reagan administration used Colombia as a vehicle to to use drug money and then, of course, dumped those drugs in poor communities, largely black communities in the U.S., which helped create the crack co cocaine epidemic. And, of course, the journalist who exposed that, Gary Webb, had his life destroyed and died in mysterious circumstances. He allegedly committed suicide, but with two gunshots to the head, not one. So anyway, the point is that in the 1990s, Bill Clinton carries out Plan Colombia, supposedly to try to end this conflict by fueling the conflict even further with tens of millions of dollars that has continued to balloon into more and more so-called aid to Colombia. And Joe Biden, on numerous occasions, has bragged of his role in Plan Colombia. And not only that, Plan Colombia, by the way, it further fueled violence. It made the insurgency even worse with the government not only killing many members of the, the leftist insurgent groups like the FARC and the ELN, but also there have been all these scandals where the Colombian military has killed civilians and then dressed them up in the uniform of the guerrillas from groups like FARC and ELN, and then what's called the false positive scandal. But not just that, um, it's also 
ballooned into the rest of the region. And Joe Biden said that he wants to apply this, this model of Plan Colombia to Central America itself, along with neoliberal privatization policies. Max, I mean, you, you wrote more about this. So do you want to talk about um, more about Biden's role? Yeah, basically, uh, the plan was originally called the Colombian Plan for Peace. And um, the president at the time, Andres Pastrana, he wanted, he actually proclaimed that the FARC was a part of the Colombian polity, that it was part of their politics, it wasn't going away, and it had to be negotiated with. Biden comes in and, you know, whips the vote in the Senate in support of this plan. Uh, and <clears throat> basically, he, he helps secure the money. He's playing a very activist role in making sure it's a plan for militarization and not to sort of uh, Pastrana wanted like a, a kind of a, a Marshall Plan that was going to support development and provide jobs for everyone in FARC so all the FARC people could come in and say, you know, I'm putting my gun down. But what actually happened with Plan Colombia was that the military and the right-wing paramilitary death squads were put on steroids. Um, they were given all kinds of new funding, funding, but not just that, they were incentivized to kill as many FARC members as possible. And the point from Washington's perspective was to have FARC show up wounded and weak at the negotiating table and willing to surrender uh, to Washington's conditions and to make sure that Colombia was this right-wing bulwark in the middle of South America, the Israel of South America. So you mentioned the false positive scandal. Um, this was part of, this. this was a, a hideous massacre, which was the direct result of Biden and Clinton and Bush basically making sure that the Colombian military was incentivized for killing FARC members. And what they did, the military did, to run up the numbers of supposed FARC members that they killed was to lure a bunch of poor, like basically day laborers, workers, um, something like 25 miles away from where they were picked up then they were all shot, and then they were their corpses were dressed up in FARC uniforms. And then the military said, we just killed this entire cell of FARC members, of like 50 FARC members. It was exposed years later um, as what I described, and it became a major national scandal. This all took place under the right-wing government of Uribe, who's really like the, the, the puppet master of the current government, Ivan Duque. But the point is that Biden and his plan, which he's bragging about, made these heinous massacres possible. And this, this, this happened all across the country. It happened again and again and again, just so the military could tell Washington, yeah, we, we wiped out the FARC. They also completely failed in drug eradication. I mean, um, basically poor farmers who were involved in the coca trade, who didn't have the organizational capacity that you know the cocaleros in Bolivia had, um, were being bombed by DEA planes um, with lethal chemicals, toxic chemicals. But I mean, a uh, UN report showed that by something like 2010, uh, Colombia was producing um, coca and exporting it at a record rate. Um, and the price of cocaine in the Western Hemisphere was cheaper than it ever had been. So the plan was a complete failure. And then Biden goes and tries to replicate it in Honduras after um, Hillary's State Department runs a coup there, which we've talked about extensively on this show. Um, it's called, it was called the Alliance for Prosperity, and it was run through the Inter-American Development Bank. It was basically a plan to neoliberalize Honduras' economy under a really corrupt right-wing regime. It wasn't just one president. It's just a straight-up regime. And it wound up uh, fueling all of these scandals where the government stole hundreds of millions of dollars from the public health care system to channel it into the current president, Juan Orlando Hernandez's campaign. As in Colombia, the president was deeply connected to drug traffickers. We've talked about that before. And Biden was the guy who was coming down there again and again, meeting with all the presidents of the Northern Triangle, Central American um, states, to trumpet this plan. I mean, Biden, again, he took a very activist role. He rolled out the plan in the New York Times, and ultimately the plan led to a major rise in electricity costs. Uh, public safety was, uh, you know, horrible. I mean, Colombia is one of the most violent countries in the Western Hemisphere. And then finally, you have the child migration crisis at the end of the Obama administration, where the children are basically coming unaccompanied, and Obama 
and Biden are telling them they have to go back. So Biden has just presided over so many very under-acknowledged um, disasters that have blown back to the U.S. We haven't even gotten to Ukraine yet, but there's also, um, I guess, Aaron uh, Mate, our colleague, interviewed Scott Ritter, who was a former U.N. weapons inspector, who had a really notable exchange with Joe Biden, where Ritter was telling Biden, essentially, that the Iraq did not have weapons of mass destruction, and Biden was dressing him down and basically verbally abusing him, just browbeating him. Um, you can show some of the video now. I think it's really remarkable. And it also shows that Biden was kind of like mentally acute at that point in his life, that you know this isn't some stuttering problem he has. He's actually just senile and has dementia. But roll that footage for like, you know, a minute. Just show Biden yelling at Scott Ritter and just how abusive he was. Quite frank, I think what you've done is you've forced us to come to our milk here, all of us in the United States Congress. You've forced us to face up to a very, very, very basic conflict. And it's a policy decision, a policy judgment that ultimately the administration has to make and we have to make as well, whether we agree or disagree with them and hopefully come forward and state it. You have clearly stated from what I've read and I expect to hear today, two of the most likely options available to us in terms of policy. One, uh, and I hope that at the end of the day, not literally this day, but the end of the debate and the political um, uh, gain and loss that falls out from your appearance and the things you've raised, I hope at the end of the day, we end up taking a stand, an unequivocal stand, we in the Congress, we in the Senate in particular. And uh, I hope we won't shrink from the choices that you've basically presented to us. This notion of inspection-driven confrontations of the Iraq was an alternative that was shelved by the Security Council, shelved by the United States at this moment, and diplomacy was, of course, sought. And obviously you disagree with that, as many, many experts do. The alternative view seems to be, and I'm not getting this from the administration, we'll hear whether this is correct, seems to be that a policy is, the primary policy is to keep sanctions in place, to deny Saddam the billions of dollars that would allow him to really crank up, really crank up his program, which neither you or I believe he is ever going to abandon as long as he is in place. And, but that doesn't uh, guarantee, if these sanctions are in place, that the program is going to be curtailed, anything other than curtailed. doesn't guarantee that we're going to be able to stop it. I think you and I believe, and many of us believe here, as long as Saddam's at the helm, there is no reasonable prospect. You or any other inspector is ever going to be able to guarantee that we have rooted out, root and branch, the entirety of Saddam's program relative to weapons of mass, de mass destruction. And you and I both know, and all of us here really know, and it's the thing we have to face, that the only way, the only way we're going to get rid of Saddam Hussein is we're going to end up having to start it alone, start it alone, and it's going to require guys like you in uniform to be back on foot in the desert taking, the son of a, the, uh, taking Saddam down. You know it, and I know it. So I think we should not kid ourselves here. There's stark, stark choices. Let me ask you a question. Do you think you should be the one to be able to decide when to pull the trigger? No, uh, sir. Isn't that what this is about? If you, if you adopt the position that any time you are denied, you, your particular, and there's four groups out there, inspectors, you're the group you headed, any time you are denied, that that ipso facto requires the United States and the Security Council to act on what they said they would do, which is to use whatever means necessary to take on Saddam Hussein so you can get into that particular facility. Is that not correct? Is that not your position? Mr. Senator, I have a job to do, or I had a job to do, and that was to disarm Iraq in accordance with the provisions no, of I got relevant that. resolutions. With all due respect, if you, I'm not trying to be confrontational. I'm trying to get this as clear as I can. I really mean this now. You have an absolute logic. You put together a very tight syllogism here. You've indicated that your job is to disarm. The only way you can disarm is to have access. The only way you can have access is either with permission on the part of Iraq or if denied, forced access, yes. right? Compelled access. Compelled. Yes. Well, okay. Compelled. You sound like the lawyer and I sound like the military guy. I mean, uh, 
you know, compelled where I come from. When my old man said you're compelled, it meant I was forced. I mean, it was a real simple proposition. It wasn't, you know, wasn't much to debate. Now, there is a clear logic to that. And that's what I mean when I say I respect your position. But that means that whenever you choose a target that warrants inspection and you are denied that ipso facto at that moment, the only way your position can be satisfied or sustained is if the UN Security Council or the United States acting unilaterally uses force to guarantee access. Is not that true? Yes, sir. Now, that means that you get to choose the time and place when we would use force, if we use force. No, sir. Of course you do. If you choose the site and it's denied. And we coordinate with the member states to include the United States. Exactly. And prior to us going in, we have their agreement that this indeed is an inspection worth doing. Okay. Inspection worth doing. Everybody's agreed it's worth doing. And it gets stopped. Yes, sir. At that moment, we're an automatic pilot as far as you're concerned. Period. Yeah, of course, it goes without saying that Biden was a huge supporter of the Iraq war. Of course, he's been lying about that record and now trying to say he opposed it. But in fact, not only did Biden support the Iraq war, he whipped Democratic votes in Congress in support of the Iraq war. And, you know, people talk about the Iraq war and Biden. But what's less talked about is that Biden strongly supported other wars, regime change wars. He strongly supported wa the war in Syria. And in fact, back in 2016, this is after Russia intervened in Syria. Uh, this is an article in Politico. Biden suggests military solution to Syrian conflict. This is well, well into the war. And by the way, this is after Biden acknowledged in uh, comments at Harvard University that the Obama administration knew that US allies like Saudi Arabia and Turkey were supporting ISIS and Al Qaeda and other extremist groups. Our biggest problem is our allies. Our allies in the region were our largest problem in Syria. The Turks were great friends and I have a great relationship with Erdogan, which I've just spent a lot of time with. The Saudis, the Emiratis, etc. What were they doing? They were so determined to take down Assad and essentially have a proxy Sunni Shia war, what did they do? They poured hundreds of millions of dollars and tens, thousands of tons of weapons into anyone who would fight against Assad. Except that the people who were being, who were being supplied were al-Nusra and al-Qaeda and the extremist elements of jihadis coming from other parts of the world. Now you think I'm exaggerating, take a look. Where did all of this go? So now what's happening? All of a sudden, everybody's awakened because this outfit called ISIL, which was Al-Qaeda in Iraq, which when they were essentially thrown out of Iraq, found open space and territory in in Western, excuse me, in Eastern Syria, work with Al Nusra, who we declared a terrorist group early on, and we could not convince our colleagues to stop supplying them. So what happened? Now all of a sudden, I don't want to be too facetious, but uh, they have seen the Lord. And so what do we have for the first time? Now Saudi Arabia has stopped the funding going in. Saudi Arabia is allowing training on its soil of American forces under Title 10, open training. The Qataris have cut off their support for the most extreme elements of the terrorist organizations. And the Turks, President Erdogan told me, he's an old friend, said, you were right, we let too many people through. Now they're trying to seal their border. So this idea that somehow it was within our power early on in this process, and there were a couple former members of the administration who were arguing we should give, quote, the opposition, which we couldn't identify as moderate, by the way, I'm serious about that, give them ground air launch missiles. Can you imagine what would have happened if that had been done? Does anybody doubt they would have been in the hands of al-Nusra or al-Qaeda or Khorasan Group or ISIL? 
So he knew what the situation was on the ground in Syria. He knew that the, the dominant force within the armed opposition were hardline Salafi jihadist extremists. And he still, as of 2016, was calling for a military solution, i.e. the U.S. military to violently intervene and overthrow the government of Syria on behalf of those insurgents. And of course, he did the same thing in 2011 in Libya. I mean, really, Biden has never seen a war he didn't love. I mean, he's really just as hawkish as many of these neoconservatives. He's really almost as hawkish as Hillary Clinton. In 2011, after the NATO war there, the regime changed war that led to the complete destruction of the Libyan state, the death of the leader Muammar Gaddafi, and the, by the way, the massive human trafficking of African refugees in open air slave markets. Well, after that NATO war, Biden said, quote, NATO got it right. In this case, America spent $2 billion and didn't lose a single life. This is more the prescription for how to deal with the world as we go forward than it has been in the past. So, and then like, like with the Iraq war. 10 years later, there, 10 years later, Libya is still in civil war. And also a few years later, Biden tried to erase his support for the war and said that he always was against the war in Libya. So it just goes to show that this is a guy who's a chronic liar, who supports a war, and then a few years later, when it's politically convenient, pretends he opposed it. Another thing that hasn't gotten much attention, because it's kind of been erased, you know, the history of all these wars, Biden was also a strong supporter of NATO's war in Yugoslavia, which you don't, we don't have time to go into the details, but I would recommend the writings of of Herman, Edward Herman, who, who wrote a series of essays at Monthly Review called The Dismantling of Yugoslavia and talks about how NATO just helped create the war and civil conflict by encouraging these right-wing nationalist separatist groups inside the former Yugoslavia. And many of those groups were fascistic and had been, had been linked to fascist Nazi collaborating groups during World War II and were the kind of remnants and ancestors. But but anyway, so the point is Biden strongly supported this NATO regime change war to balkanize and destroy Yugoslavia, so much so that he lionized some of the, the Salafi jihadi extremists who in many ways were kind of similar to the Mujahideen in Afghanistan who were fighting the Soviet Union, these kind of CIA proxies backed by the CIA, Pakistan, and Saudi Arabia. But also in Yugoslavia, the U.S. supported many uh, extremist is Islamist groups that, in fact, Jeremy Scahill, once he got in trouble for correctly describing as white Al-Qaeda, um, the U.S. supported some of these groups like the KLA and NATO supported these groups. And Biden was a huge supporter. Well, they were also like a mafia and gun runners. It wasn't just ideologues. They were just a criminal gang. Absolutely. Biden was one of the main supporters of these uh, these groups inside Yugoslavia, and they returned the favor. Uh, Biden famously referred to the KLA, this extremist group that murdered civilians that trafficked drugs, these, these gangs, fascistic gangs. He referred to them as, as heroes, like the founding fathers. And then now, here's a Reuters report. We owe you so much, Kosovo to tell Biden as street named after late son. They named Kosovo repaid the favor to Biden for his strong support for the NATO war in Yugoslavia by renaming a major street after Bo Biden. So that says everything. I mean, this is a guy who has made his entire career supporting every single war as a right wing Democrat. And this is the figure that not just Buttigieg and Klobuchar and the Democratic Party leadership is unifying behind, but also Barack Obama, by the way. And we now know because NBC reported that it was Obama who pressured Buttigieg and the other candidates to drop out and endorse Biden, which they did immediately. So we, we've, we, we've talked about for many years that, you know, Obama was a total fraud, that he was this right-wing neoliberal. Of course, he oversaw these, these wars we were just talking about, but that, that should really just be in the nail in the coffin, that Obama does not have a progressive bone in his body. And well, it's understandable and we expect it. I mean, it's not like unexpected. Uh, also, Obama did kind of discourage Biden from running because he knows how unelectable he is. But Obama is basically going to act behind the scenes against Bernie Sanders. 
And at a certain, at some time in the future, I think we can expect Obama to appear publicly in support of Biden if Biden can like stir up enough confidence. Um, but I, it's also worth mentioning that Obama did kind of hide his support from Biden until now, and that he uh, hasn't come out publicly for him and discouraged him. And that really speaks to Biden's weakness. At Biden's victory speech just now, he confused his own wife and daughter. And there's a key difference between Barack Obama. There's a key difference between Obama and Biden, which is that Obama gave his little token speech against the Iraq war when he was a state senator down in Hyde Park, one of the most liberal districts in the country or most progressive districts in the country. Biden whipped the vote for the Iraq war. There's a very good documentary by Mark Weisbrot about Biden's support for the Iraq war. And it wasn't just support. It was that Biden year after year was pushing, moving the ball towards a U.S. invasion of Iraq and that he was deeply invested in seeing this happen. And there has not been, to my knowledge, one candidate who supported and voted for the war on Iraq in the Senate who was elected. Donald Trump ran basically against the war. Hillary Clinton voted for it, said that Saddam had WMD and she lost. Uh, before that, Joe, uh, John McCain lost to um, to Barack Obama. So this is another liability of Joe Biden, and I think the support for him is pretty thin. Um, but you know that we haven't even talked about Ukraine. And we're gonna the reason we're talking about Ukraine is if Biden's the nominee, that's what we're going to be talking about for the next several months. It's like this won't go away, but the public doesn't understand this very well. Even a lot of people um, who I meet who are burners, who are hardcore Bernie Sanders fans, they're sort of reluctant to get into the issue of Biden's corruption. Um, they might even dismiss it. They don't see the seriousness of it, partly because Trump is the one who is carrying this narrative forward about Hunter Biden, um, Joe Biden's sort of um, bad son, uh, crackhead son, former, or I don't want to demonize him for that. I mean, it's, it's tragic. But, you know, his son who had serious drug problems and is now enjoying sort of a second life as a painter who's being hyped up in the New York Times for his, his paintings that sort of, they look like outsider art by a seven-year-old. But in any case, they... Um, you know, Hunter Biden was put on the the payroll of Burisma, a Ukrainian natural gas company, to the tune of eighty thousand dollars a month. He had no qualifications. He's admitted that it was a big mistake, but at the time he made about a million dollars. And this was a company run by uh, Mykola Zlochevsky, a Ukrainian oligarch who is trying to buy goodwill in Washington following the Maidan coup that Joe Biden personally presided over. Before we bring in James Carden, I just think, first of all, I would emphasize the importance of this being talked about now within the left, within the democratic primary process, but also um, it's important to understand the broader outlines of the coup that took place. And here's why. Because the coup severed Ukraine from its historic and largest trading partner in Russia, which is its neighbor. And the US and the nationalist elements it empowered in Kiev basically completely cut themselves off economically from Russia. And they sought to kind of create this, um, you know, they, they fueled a, a proxy war in the East. One of the main imports that Ukraine received from Russia was natural gas. That's how they fueled their homes. Russia gave them very favorable rates and it was part of Russia's soft power in the region, obviously. So the importance of companies like Burisma became central after the coup. And Joe Biden was running around speaking at the Atlantic Council, a place, a think tank in Washington that was raking in tons of money a year from Burisma, talking about the importance of supporting domestic natural gas producers in Ukraine at the same time that Burisma was paying his son 80000 a year, that his son was speaking, delivering keynote speeches in Monaco for Burisma conferences. So even if, the, you know, they, they say, Biden says, I didn't, my son did nothing wrong and I didn't fire that um, prosecutor who was investigating him because he was. But, I mean, put the pieces together. Look at the role Biden was playing in 
Ukraine. He was basically the imperial lord of Ukraine for over a year after the coup while his son was taking that money. So this isn't going to go away. And we should understand the issue and how regime change, once again, as with Benghazi and Hillary Clinton's campaign, which directly lowered public trust in Hillary Clinton and was used successfully by the Republicans to do so, regime change is going to blow back on the Biden campaign. Uh, maybe now we could bring, uh, we could have James fill us in and talk about what it was actually like working in the State Department when Biden was VP. I'll never apologize for the United States of America. Ever. I don't care what the facts are. Why are we going to sit down and talk to these quote-unquote moderate rebels? Who are the truly moderate rebels? The search for the moderate rebel. Do these moderate rebels exist? Moderate rebels. All right, so we're here with James Carden, who has uh, been writing principally for the nation on uh, foreign policy. And you know, he's written for a number of publications. Um, he, he really, um, his writing really resonates with me when he speaks to the mentality of the liberal interventionist that he actually was in very close contact with when he worked in the State Department under Obama. Um, James, uh, you have a very um, defined, well-defined view of Biden and many of the people around him, uh, many of his advisors. Um, you know, tell us what you, you know, what you think about the person who's being put forward um, as the great white hope of the Democratic establishment, and who's also been endorsed uh, today by James Comey and John Brennan. So you know, he got he's got the deep state endorsement. Um, you know, do you see him as negatively as we do, as a force for, uh, as a sort of malevolent force on the world stage? And and how can and how would you describe the mentality of his advisors? Right, I think that the idea that we're going to put a candidate who is um, older and in severe um, cognitive, obvious cognitive decline, who basically embodies the same principles and policies as the candidate that the Democrats put forward in 2016, that somehow uh, that is the uh, ticket to success in November seems to me to be um, uh, self-deluded at best. Um, Biden is simply um, an extension of the, he's a representation of the same old, same old, the same old liberal interventionist policies that the United States um, has been uh, following for the past 30 years. Uh, there's nothing new under the sun here. Uh, and I think that that's a recipe for disaster in, in, in November. Uh, Joe Biden famously was put in charge of Iraq policy under Obama and Ukraine policy under Obama. Um, and I think that a fair reading, just a fair reading, because I, I worked in the Hillary Clinton State Department briefly, um, of the Obama-Biden foreign policy track record, if you look at what happened in Syria and Libya and Yemen and Ukraine, um, you know, it, it's really a stain on the conscience of our nation. I, I, I really find it very hard to believe these liberals and self-described progressives who get themselves all worked up about Donald Trump, his obvious vulgarity and his tweets and all that stuff. The fact of the matter is, is that uh, you know, if you look at presidencies in the post-war era, um, Mr. Trump has done relatively, um, in terms of simply bloodshed, uh, relatively little damage when you compare um, the presidencies of Truman, uh, Johnson, and uh, uh, Nixon, and uh, Clinton, and Bush, uh, and Obama. Yeah. So the fact that he's a crude, you know, uh, Spy Magazine famously called him a short-fingered Bulgarian. I mean, all of, all of that's true. I can't help. I just find it hard to believe that Biden is somehow um, morally more acceptable, um, given what we know about uh, his family. Um, you know, nothing comparable 
has happened in Trump world uh, remotely as gross uh, as um, what happened with Hunter and the widow of uh, his dead brother. Uh, you know, uh, Hunter was running around uh, with the widow, uh, and uh, Joe and Jill issued a uh, a letter supporting this. Uh, you know, wholeheartedly, it was a wonderful thing that that they found each other. And I, I worry. Uh, sorry to cut in, but I, I worry that Trump could actually warn um, that you know, as a kind of a talking point or an applause line that Joe Biden will do to America what his uh, son did to his dead brother's wife. Oh, my God. <laughs> I mean, it wouldn't, I mean how, that would, wouldn't surprise me at all. I mean, look at what he did with Clintons. I mean, he invited uh, Bill Clinton's victims to one of the debates. Right. Um, so, you know, the idea that Joe Biden is... Uh, you know, the Biden family is somehow morally superior to the Trump family or that, you know, Joe Biden's policies are somehow less bloodthirsty and um, self-interested than Joe Biden's foreign policies strike me as somewhat ridiculous. I mean, you know, the other thing is that Biden is very much captive to this idea that Hillary, uh, Hillary Clinton said this also, that America is already great. That it doesn't need to be great again. Uh, it is in his speech tonight. Uh, he said that, um, I think he said, you know, if we put our minds to it, there's not a single thing we can't do. Uh, I can't think of a few few things, including um, providing health care to our citizens, decent paying jobs, winning wars, um, taking care of society's most vulnerable, our wounded veterans, homeless people. Um, We can't tame the banks. Uh, We can't stop. Um, you know, offshoring jobs and uh, these ridiculous preventing Houston and New Orleans from being consumed by the Gulf of Mexico. You're right. So uh, you know, uh, I can... put our minds to it. Just you know, that's very New Agey, actually. When you think about it. yeah, Marianne Williamson. That, that's kind of, that would have been her one of her campaign slogans. Yeah, but you know, anyway. So I, I okay. obviously take a dim view of the Biden candidacy, but you know. Um, I mentioned, you know, uh, cognitive decline, uh, you know, earlier. You know, I saw Joe Biden in, on his book tour in, uh, in 2017 uh, in Chicago in a relatively small, small venue. And I personally was shocked by what I saw. And he, he would speak in a regular tone and then all of a sudden just pop off and start screaming for no reason. Um, and so I found it to be a rather alarming. Turn on the record player. Get on the telephone. 300% of children who read do so. Why, 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 why? Like that kind of stuff. Yeah. And I think that, you know, the I, I mean, I have to, I'll say this. I am extremely impressed, deeply impressed by the Democratic, uh, uh, Democratic Party establishment and the, what they did tonight. Yeah. It's what the Republicans couldn't do with Jeb Bush. Right. Oh, it's what the Democrats couldn't do to prevent Trump. I mean, they've been very disciplined. They, um, it's really quite. I, there's no. I have this feeling that there's just no way that the the, the DNC is just is going to allow Bernie to, uh, to to get the nomination. So we're going to be stuck with something like Biden Klobuchar, or Biden Warren, and it's going to go down in flames. So we, we we've been just talking, um, you know, before um, you came on, we we were talking about Ukraine and. The idea that if Biden is the nominee, we're just going to be hearing about the Burisma scandal nonstop. Uh, and we're going to be hearing about Ukraine nonstop. So I don't know, maybe you could kind of walk us through some of the details there, what you, what you see, if you see any wrongdoing with Biden in Ukraine and what actually happened in Ukraine that led us up to this moment of impeachment and the Burisma scandal. I think a lot of people would be surprised to learn that the Ukraine crisis, um, which began in, in earnest in November of 2013, really was a dispute over a trade deal. Um, and uh, it was the, the, the duly uh, elected president of that country, Viktor Yanukovych, um, spurned a offer from the EU and IMF um, and went uh, and, ex- and accepted a, a more generous package uh, from uh, from Russia, and this led to protests among the um, small but uh, uh, pro- protests in Kiev among you know uh, Ukrainian intellectuals, neoliberals. Uh, the, the 
the protests were quickly overtaken by more sinister forces in that country, uh, and it culminated in the violent overthrow of a democratically elected uh, president. During that time, it was Joe Biden who told Yanukovych to stand down He's, and warned him not to uh, disperse uh, the protesters. Now, at the time, those protesters were, um, it, it became extremely violent, and there's no way that our government would have accepted protests on a similar scale in our own capital. But uh, Joe Biden um, then took over uh, the, um, the, the administration's policy uh, in Ukraine, and it was, it, it, it was an dis absolute disaster. Um, and uh, it, it resulted in a, in a war, a uh, shooting war in Europe on the border of Russia that killed uh, 10,000 or so people, uh, resulted in the displacement of uh, well over a million. Uh, and w it was potentially one of the most destabilizing um, uh, incidents uh, to occur on the European continent um, since probably well, since Kosovo in 1999, which was another uh, U.S. foul up um, that almost resulted in World War III, thanks to Wesley Clark. But that's a different story. So, um, you know, Joe Biden's handling of the Ukraine crisis um, has uh, much to be desired, um, and I, I think. You know, it, it, given the record of the Obama-Biden administration, foreign policy is disqualifying. He really shouldn't be running for president. Did Do you believe that he fired the public prosecutor, Victor Shokin, in order to protect his son's $80,000 a month board member position at Burisma? Do you think there's anything to that? I, I, would, I don't know. It, it wouldn't surprise me. Uh, given the degradation of uh, the you know, transatlantic elites that we've seen over the past uh, 30, 40 years. Uh, I wouldn't put it past them, but, you know, the Bidens have been at this for a long time, uh, so it's unlikely that we're going to find fingerprints. But I mean, there's some evidence, too, that his brother has, uh, has benefited rather handsomely from, from, um, from deals in Iraq uh, and China. Uh, it's very much a family, family affair uh, when it comes to the Bidens. Um, and it's not something that, you know, we complain about the obvious corrupt, I, the obvious corruption of the Trumps. But really, I think Democrats are fooling themselves. The, the Biden clan is going to be any less uh, rapacious than the uh, acquisitive, um, any less acquisitive than the Clinton clan was and is or the Biden clan. It's just different. They're just different parties at this point. I mean, they're sort of different, different uh, clans or dynastic clans within one sort of rotten establishment. Is what you're saying? Yeah, I mean, it's not, it's obvious now that we've descended. And unfortunately, you know, um, I think since '16, it's kind of obvious that we've descended into oligarchy. Um, and I think the only you know way out of it is to elect um, someone who doesn't have obvious financial interests in every governmental decision that they'd make. And that would be someone like um, uh, Mr. Sanders, who, you know, um, has led, I think, a rather admirable um, life and career, but um, that's you know, poison to, uh, to the Democratic establishment. James, can you also give us an idea of what your impression was with working within the State Department of what Biden's kind of guiding foreign policy ideology is? Do you think that he very much falls in line with the kind of hardline neoconservative foreign policy of people like Bill Clinton and even and, and like Hillary Clinton and even figures like, you know, the actual neoconservatives, Bill Kristol, these, these other figures? Do you think that Biden falls more in line ideologically with them? Or do you think that maybe he is kind of more of like a liberal interventionist, like someone like Samantha Power? I mean, can you give us an idea of what what you kind of ideologically associate him with? Yeah, I would say that he falls squarely in line with the Democratic, actually with the bipartisan uh, consensus of uh, American global hegemony and uh, liberal intervention, um, particularly humanitarian uh, intervention. Um, I would say, I, I've been trying to think of, you know, has there been any sensible um, high-ranking Democrat uh, in terms of foreign policy, to occupy high office uh, in, 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 over the past you know decade, fifteen years post nine eleven, I think maybe Tom Donlan 
Uh, Tom Donlin seemed to have a very different view um, than Samantha Power or Susan Rice uh, regarding intervention. He seemed to be more cautious. I think maybe it's a positive sign that the that Biden and the Don, and the Donlins are close, but. I think if you look at Biden's record, you'll see someone squarely in the tradition of, of Hillary Clinton, Power, and, and, and Rice. Yeah. Where do you think he would differ from Trump? Um, you know, one place that I thought Hillary Clinton would have, well, where, where they clashed in the debates, Hillary and Trump, was on a no-fly zone in Syria, um, which would have been absolutely insane to to enact. It would have... Um, the implication was war with direct war with hot war with Russia and Iran, um, as well as the Syrian military. If you do that, and the, you know, the the march towards Damascus once again of Al Qaeda and friends, um, you know, is there? Do you think Biden would be materially different on any issues? Yeah, I can think of maybe three. Uh, I think that he'd be better on arms control. Uh, Trump has been in a just abomination, um, tearing up the INF. He is uh, the arms trade treaty and uh, new start. It doesn't look like they're going to renew next year. Uh, so I think Biden would be better on arms control. I think that uh, he would be better um, with regard to trying to get back into the Iranian nuclear deal. And uh, he'd probably get us back uh, onto the Paris climate accord. So I think, you know, there are areas that, um, you know, where you could say that a Biden presidency would be an obvious improvement. Um, however, there are areas where it would, he would quite possibly be, be much worse. And Syria is one of those areas. Uh, relations right. uh, yeah. with Russia is another one of those areas. Um, and any other sort of, you know, you never know what's going to, you know, Libya is still not settled. Right? Well, well, any, um, any sort of humanitarian. Well, well, Sorry, North Korean leader uh, Kim Jong Un compared Biden to a rabid dog, <laughs> and said that he needed to be beaten to death with a stick. Uh, that it would be good for the not only the world but for the United States. Um, and this was in response to some really bellicose comments that Biden made and attacks that Biden made on Trump's um, summit with Kim Jong Un. Uh, I think. You know, a lot of this is partisan politics, a lot of the attacks on Trump. Oh, he loves the North Korean dictator who has dogs eat his family for fun. But at the same time, it signals a more aggressive policy. I mean, that was one of the few bright spots of the Trump presidency was at least attempting a kind of, uh, you know, a, a, a cessation of hostilities between North and South Korea. It went, obviously, down in flames. Yeah, that's right. And I also think that um, he would be more bellicose. You would get a worse policy towards China, too. Uh, on, the, on the one hand, um, Biden would be much easier on the Chinese than Trump has been in terms of trade. Um, and you would also get a more bellicose policy with regard to the, the uh, burgeoning conflict in the South China Sea. So I think that Biden's China policy would be demonstrably uh, worse. Right, and he would push the human rights angle as well against yeah, China. We a lot more about the Uyghurs in, in, um, in, in uh, Hong Kong and so yeah. forth. Yeah, so I mean that, that would be worrying um, because you could potentially see these masterminds that he surrounded himself with looking at what's going on in Hong Kong and thinking, hey, there's an opportunity. Why don't we do – to the Chinese there, what we uh, attempted to do to, you know, the, the Russians in, in Maidan. Right. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, there's a lot to worry about um, with regard to Biden and the people that um, he surrounds himself with. I hope that he would surround himself with um, people who are sort of more cautious, like, like Domlin, and, and uh, rather than people who I think have absolutely taken leave of their sen senses, like a Samantha Power. Well, I, I mean, it's a really good segue because you said people he surrounds himself with. And, you know, someone he's surrounded himself with who's the head of the Biden Penn Center at the University of Pennsylvania, who immediately um, took up residence there while also enjoying a non-resident fellowship at the Atlanta Council, which was funded by Burisma, was Biden's um, Ukraine and Eastern Europe handler, Michael Carpenter. Um, and this is someone who I interacted with 
and he's never forgiven me for this interaction. He's like obsessively attacked me on Twitter. He calls me a, like a Russian scumbag. I mean, he uses every kind of slander. He's just absolutely off his rocker. And what did I do with Michael Carpenter? I politely interviewed him at an event uh, inside the U.S. Capitol where Carpenter and you know various other um, you know foreign policy hacks on the Hill were shepherding around a Ukrainian ultra-nationalist. You could even call him a neo-Nazi, uh, Andrei Perubi, in 2017. And I brought a camera and asked um, Carpenter about Perubi having founded two neo-Nazi parties, the Social National Party and the Patriot of Ukraine, which is like a Nazi militia in Ukraine, um, having you know worn a brown shirt uniform with a pistol on his waist on the cover of his memoir, his kind of Mein Kampf style memoir. And Carpenter was really agitated and he said, Perubi's just a patriot and, you know, he's just, he's just, uh, you know, someone who cares a lot about his country. And then he stormed off and then, you know, unlo unleashed this torrent of invective against me on Twitter. Following the Senate event, I spotted Michael Carpenter, a former State Department official who helped encourage the 2014 Maidan coup in Ukraine alongside his boss, then Vice President Joe Biden. Did you think it was a good idea to bring Perubi, who's founded two neo-Nazi parties, to the Senate and for Paul Ryan to meet with him? Look, I think uh, Andrei Perubi is a uh, conservative uh, nationalist who is a also a patriot cares about his country. I don't think he has any neo-national neo-Nazi uh, uh, inclinations uh, nor background. I mean, a lot has been made of this. Frankly, I think it's uh, mostly Russian propaganda. But it's not just the Russians who've reeled in horror at Perubi's far-right background. Eugene Robinson, a columnist for the Washington Post, described the party that Perubi founded as openly neo-fascist, and the Atlantic Council. The NATO-funded think tank that currently employs Carpenter recently acknowledged that Ukraine's got a real problem with far-right violence, and no, RT, the Russian-backed broadcaster, didn't write this headline. For people like Carpenter, though, disturbing historical facts like these matter less than the chance to saber-rattle against Russia. So you don't so, think there's anything troubling about his views? Uh, I think his views that he's articulated now uh, are on the record and uh, support, as I said, reconciliation with Poland, uh, freedom and sovereignty for Ukraine, and I think that's a positive thing. And anti-Semitism in Ukraine? I don't know if you want to talk about him personally, but I know he was in the State Department at around the time you were there. Um, but maybe this is an opportunity for you to speak more about the mentality of the people who, I mean, Biden, you know, right now is in very much in need of um, outsourced brains because his own one doesn't seem to be functioning. So we know Carpenter is going to be in the tank with Biden, uh, but maybe you could give a general impression if you don't want to talk about him personally. Yeah, no, I, I think another person that um, we ought to highlight from the Penn Biden Center is um, and someone who is rather more high ranking um, than, than Mike Carpenter is uh, Tony Blinken. Uh, Blinken oh, yeah. is really, I think, the chief of the uh, of the foreign policy uh, brain trust, and his record doesn't inspire a lot of confidence either. When he was deputy secretary of state, um, you know, one of the things that's interesting about a character like Perubi, you know, I covered Perubi's first trip to uh, the U.S. after the uh, the Maidan. He was invited to speak to uh, something called the U.S. Ukrainian Business Council, and it was held. And the building that houses the Council on Foreign Relations, a downtown not so far from the White House, and um, you know I was really struck the by the um, people who were invited. Um, I should say that I wasn't invited. I lied and said that my invitation got lost in the mail, and I managed to sneak in. Um, you know there were uh, current U.S. officials there. There were think tank uh, people there. There were former ambassadors, and they gave this guy. <laughs> Well, as you say, I mean, the, the cover of his memoir, it looks like Mein Kampf. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, this guy served, uh, according to the program, he served as the commandant of the Euromaidan. Um, now, I thought that the Euromaidan Revolution of Dignity was just a peaceful protest. Um, so why would I need a comment? I don't, 
I don't remember there being a need for a commandant during the women's march after Trump was inaugurated. I don't know. I might have missed it. You know, so this guy is obviously bad news. Did the women's uh, march have Georgian snipers, by the way? Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, you know, With pussy hats. Not to, not to make light of, you know, the, the, the sniper incident, but, you know, um, in the months and years following that, footage has emerged uh, of Peruvi standing outside and ordering and directing people in and out of that hotel. So, yeah. um, and, you know, I would just... For people listening and who aren't that familiar with the sort of far right neo Nazi um, color of of that revolution, I would urge them to read my friend uh, Levka Lincoln, uh, who has done great work on that. Uh, for the we'll next. put that in the show notes. Yeah, um, and he's an ex- he's a true expert and someone who grew up in Kharkiv and immigrated here as a kid. Um, a remarkable story in and of itself. So, but anyway, back to Peruby. So Peruby recites all the usual nonsense at this event, um, how, you know, they're fighting the Russians there, so we don't have to fight them here. And, and all this nonsense that has been recycled so often that it's made its way into, you know, um, the impeachment. Adam Schiff said the same thing during the impeachment trial. Um, and after Peruby gave this, you know, off the wall uh, presentation, you know, you had someone like a former U.S. ambassador to Ukraine, John Herbst, uh, say that, you know, that was really wonderful. And uh, another... Uh, a neocon named Ariel Cohen, who uh, who has been with the Atlanta Council, said that you know uh, he said Andre, it, this was inspiring and impressive, and really I couldn't get out of there quickly enough. I don't I don't know <laughs> what I don't know what's wrong with these people, but you know it's it's one of the characteristics of of U.S. foreign policy, particularly under Obama, that we always end up in bed with the very people who hate us most and who are absolutely um, 180 degrees uh, from the values that that we say we believe in. So uh, in Ukraine, we ended up on the side of arming uh, uh, neo-Nazi battalions. Um, That's a policy, by the way, that um, Amy Klobuchar is Amy Klobuchar is very, very for. Um, She made a trip to the Ukrainian front lines with John McCain um, and I think Lindsey Graham uh, a few years ago. So she's totally on board with that. Um, you know, even a, mo- um, a even a progressive, uh, it, should Biden pick one like Sherrod Brown, he's the same way. Um, and then, you know, in Syria, uh, we ended up on the same side as the very people who attacked us on 9-11, funding them. So it's a kind of a bizarre foreign policy where we end up uh, on the side of neo-Nazis. Yeah, we used to ask, why do they hate us? Now we have to ask, why do we love them? Yeah, Max. Yeah. Max opened his yeah. book, Management of Savagery, with was it Jake Sullivan, Hillary Clinton's yeah. advisor, and an email said, "AQ is on our side in Syria." Right, right. One of those like, le- like gleefully, you know, like he's chirping. Those emails are really fast. The State Department had to during the campaign. <laughs> to remember, they were forced by a fed, by a federal judge to release those emails. So there's a great you know trove of these that you can find on the State Department website. They make for fascinating. Uh, and really, really depressing reading. Uh, and that Sullivan email is uh, one of the outstanding ones. Because they're not stupid. They know what they're doing. I just, I, I, I just don't know why they're doing it. Um, but it will be more of the same under Joe. Yeah, well, well the, the, it's the Cold War mentality and the enemy of the enemy is your friend. And you want to stick it to the Russians. You want to stick it to whoever it is whoever the enemy is this week and the even the Trump Pentagon released the national security strategy in 2017 saying very clearly that the new supposed national security threats the the greatest so-called threats are Russia and China and great power competition in fact sometimes i listen to some of the uh, the beltway podcast to kind of understand what some of these NATSAC, military industrial complex hacks are thinking. And I listened to the podcast from War on the Rocks, and there's a few of them, but I, I remember actually hearing some military guys were discussing how great power competition has become yet another military acronym that's commonly used now, GPC. So, I mean, I think this really <laughs> colors the, the worldview of these people now where great power competition, the idea that Russia and also China are the biggest threats to the U.S. 
it's it's such a commonplace idea that they have their own three three letter acronym to refer to it. And I'm wondering if maybe James, did you see? We we did see with the Obama administration the the pivot to Asia, uh, more discussion of trying to to. I don't, it depends what verb you want to use, but really try to encircle China. Um, I mean, China is a huge country, but um, did you see the origins of this kind of great power competition foreign policy in your years? We, we definitely saw it with the Ukraine policy, but do you think that it also extended to China? Yeah, I think one of the I think I think people would be surprised with regard to the, the, the Asia pivot, um, which is really, you know, an attempt to... Um, surround China with with, with hostile uh, states um, is that it, it, it originated out of Jim Webb's office. Um, Jim Webb was and who's normally very sensible and realistic um, on foreign policy. Um, it, that that was his brainchild, and he he sort of um, uh, convinced the administration to to, to follow that. Now, I, I think that the GPC they, these people love acronyms, don't they? Uh, <laughs> the GPC. Um, is also now a uh, standard um, talking point within the uh, progressive foreign policy community as well. Um, I recently wrote about um, wh what I kind of see as a neo-progressive internationalism um, yes. that is pretty good on ending the, you know, the so-called forever wars, but not so good on uh, the new Cold War. In fact, they seem to be advocating for a uh, two-front Cold War one with Russia, one with China, kind of uh, a, you know. Um, and I think that some of these... these Sorry to inter interrupt, but, uh, you know, I just was at the launch of the Quincy Institute, which they, they, you know, which is this new initiative in Washington dedicated to ending endless war. There's some good people associated with it, Trita Parsi, Andrew Bacevich, um, and they, at their launch, which they, where they partnered with Foreign Policy, which is not a progressive publication, um, although you know they gave them space in their new um, in, in 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 one issue, um, and you know David Petraeus was allowed to hold forth on stage. I don't know how he was not paid to be there, but I really got the sense that you know the, the this new emerging mentality that you described in your piece was really the de, sort of the <clears throat> de facto position, and that this think tank was with some notable exceptions in terms of personnel, um, really in Washington to popularize it. And definitely, you know, listening to Matt Duss and seeing the positions coming out of the Bernie Sanders camp, um, that's, that's what I get, sort of a kind of neo-progressive imperialism um, and very anti-China. The China panel was strongly anti-China. Yeah, I mean, it sort of occurs to me that one of the main problems with foreign policy advisors um, like Duss and um, Sasha Baker, who is uh, Warren's foreign policy advisor, who apparently has uh, something called ninja-like solving problem solving. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> read some, uh, but even though she won't uh, say what any of her actual foreign policy positions are, uh, David Cleon the New York writer, who? Uh, exactly. He told me that she has ninja-like capabilities. We don't, we don't know exactly what that means because she didn't say a single policy position. Yeah. So, I mean, but I think that, you know, people who kind of lionize Duss and Baker are making kind of a fundamental mistake in that they place them in opposition to the blob, right, to the establishment consensus. But they're really very, very much a part of it. Um, yeah. I, I Duss, think, you know, when Duss was at Think Progress... There was the purge of Think Progress writers, Ali Garib, Eli Clifton, Fez Shakir, who's now, I think, chief of staff to Bernie. Um, a lot of it had to do with their uh, Fear Incorporated report on Islamophobia, but also they were you know, pushing too hard against the campaign to sabotage uh, what was emerging as an Iran nuclear deal. They were pushing hard against the neocons, and you know, the Israel lobby pressure came down, and weirdly... You know, Matt Dust stayed when the rest of them were purged. He just decided he kind of got with the program. Some of one, a few of them resigned out of solidarity with the others, but he stayed and he remained within what can. I mean, Center for American Progress, the parent of Think Progress, is although Think Progress has a lot of progressives, it, it is the blob. Um, and you know what I get 
from the Sanders foreign policy people is, first of all, there is an internal debate going on. And I know some people who agree 100% with us who are inside the Sanders campaign and they're, you know, then there's dust. But the dominant position is sort of, you know, a very strong opposition to, you know, conventional warfare, uh, even, you know, reluctance to kind of the kinetic counterterror approach of Obama, but uh, very vehement support for kind of promoting democracy, uh, which is still regime change politics and which is hybrid warfare nonetheless. Yeah, and I think that, you know, um, Baker, you know, came up as an eighth. Sasha Baker is Elizabeth Warren's sort of foreign policy chief. Uh, ninja advisor. like foreign policy chief. Ninja, foreign policy ninja. And uh, <laughs> and she came up uh, as an aide to Ashton Carter in the Obama Department of Defense. So, and I, I think that... And then went to CNAS, Center for New American Security, which is a very yeah. militaristic Democrat think tank. Yeah, I think, isn't that headed by... Um, it was Victoria Newland for a long time. Who was the who, one of the... Main um, cookie distributor, Maidan cookie distributor. Right. Um, so you know, I think that the idea that these people are looking to seriously challenge you know, the uh, you know underlying premises of, of U.S. Uh, military hegemony um, are wrong. I mean, these people are just gonna they're gonna tinker around the edges and get a lot of credit for being, you know, revolutionary or or whatever. But um, y- you can't have a real serious progressive foreign policy if you're, you know, going to um, call for a new Cold War with um, the world's, you know, second largest nuclear power. I don't, the problem with the, with the progressives is that I think they genuinely do care about um, what goes on in other countries and how other countries treat um people who are uh, minorities and, um, you know, um, but the idea that you are going to be able to affect that change through an NGO led democracy promotion regime change operation seems to me uh, misguided at best. And I, I think that, you know, the way that the United States, you know, ought to try to affect change in the world is to improve our own society. Um, but they don't really, when it comes to foreign policy, they have a real blind spot there. Yeah, I mean, the Koch wing of the, because the Quincy Institute's funded by Koch and Soros, and Soros is, a, you know, the anti-communist billionaire who funds damn near every regime change NGO uh, that you can think of. Um, but the Koch people sounded more sensible because they have the kind of isolationist Buchananite mentality. Um, although they don't really want to improve our society, they at least want to keep us home. Mm-hmm. Well, Soros is re- was really one of the uh, main cheerleaders for the U- the regime change operation in Ukraine. I mean, there's it, you can find this easily on the internet. I would urge people to look up his conversation with then U.S. Ambassador Jeffrey Piat. Uh, so, so I've asked myself, sort of, why is it why is Quincy sort of not you know calling for you know an end to the new Cold War and things like that? I think maybe the answer has to do with. Uh, that, that they get some of their funding from, uh, yeah, they don't talk, right. Sure. Yeah. And they don't talk about sanctions or hybrid warfare either. Actually, I asked, uh, someone affiliated with the Institute, why don't you, why is there no mention of sanctions in your material? And they said, well, we don't have any funding to do any work on that. So that kind of yeah. goes to your point. I, I asked someone as well, and I was told exactly the same answer that they don't have funding for specific anti-sanctions work, which says everything about, well, first of all, is it not a priority? I mean, you don't have funding specifically for it. Then, well, then why don't you make, why don't you, you know, turn and create a position and find funding for it? But it's clearly something that the main financiers are not a fan of. Ben, let me ask you something. Cause I mean, we're, we should probably wrap up, but you know, there are a lot of people in our circles in the anti-war movement who are very supportive of Bernie Sanders who I think are level-headed. They're not, you know, glassy-eyed followers who actually believe that he's an anti-imperialist, but they support the movement behind him. Um, You know, what, do you, do you think there could be any change in uh, foreign policy under a Sanders 
administration because it's pretty clear what would happen under Biden. Um, but you know, Bernie is um, he, he opens a lot of possibilities, at least in my view, that it's sort of uh, at least a gradual democratization of foreign policy where social movements would have a stake in it. Well, that's a great question. I'm interested in, we'll, we'll, we'll pitch the question to James after, but what I'll say is that Bernie has a mixed record. I mean, Bernie compared to the rest of the U.S. political establishment has a great record in the context of the U.S. Bernie opposed the war in Iraq. Bernie has taken a leadership role in opposing the war in Yemen, which is now almost never discussed. I mean, it, it was discussed in the first year or two of the Trump administration when Trump was sword dancing with the Saudis and holding the magic orb. But, you know, the war in Yemen has, it, it has de-escalated, but it hasn't ended. And there are still, there's still the largest humanitarian catastrophe on earth. So Bernie deserves some credit for helping take the lead in trying to end that war. But of course, Bernie, you know, compared to anti-war figures and anti-imperialists around the world, Bernie is still very much imperfect. I mean, he supported the war in Yugoslavia. He supported the war in Libya, which, as we were discussing, just destroyed the Libyan state and unleashed a massive refugee crisis that helped fuel the largest refugee crisis since World War II, even though Libya is not discussed as much as Syria. You know, Bernie has learned from that and he's spoken out against what happened in Libya and said that he would not repeat something like that. But the thing about Bernie is that I don't think we should pretend like he's something other than what he is. Bernie has always focused primarily on domestic issues, on inequality, the billionaire class, Wall Street, and those are all extremely important issues. And I'm very glad that he is making those major campaign points because most Democrats until recently would never even talk about those issues because they were funded by Wall Street. But at the same time, I think there is a tendency among some of his hardcore base to pretend like he is, heck, his foreign policy is perfect. And I, I'm thinking Jacobin published an article about Bernie the anti-imperialist, which is frankly pretty hilarious. Bernie is not an anti-imperialist. He has taken some good positions, but he's not an ideological anti-imperialist. And let's not forget that Bernie was actually friends with major anti-imperialist thinkers like Michael Parenti, and they actually had a falling out in the 1990s over Bernie's support for the NATO's war in Yugoslavia. So An another I mean, point, just not to cut you off, but just to jump, to, to interject, um, during the giant anti-war mobilizations against the war in Iraq, all Bernie Sanders had to do was walk down the street to appear there. He was invited there by the organizers of International Answer and United Anti-War Coalition, and he didn't attend, but Jeremy Corbyn on his own dime flew across the Atlantic to appear there. I think that if if we're looking at what to expect from a uh, Bernie presidency, I think, you know, as I previously stated, I think he'd be worse on China and Russia, but I think he would be an improvement in a number of areas. Um, I, th I think that we would see fewer regime change wars. Um, I think that he would be tougher on the Saudis and the Israelis. Um, I think he would be better on arms control. I think that he would try to strengthen uh, the UN or at least um, unlike, you know, recent American presidents, at least pretend to pay attention to it. Um, he'd be better on climate. Uh, he would, I think, probably try to continue the Obama policy of opening to Iran. Um, but I think, you know, there's a real worry since the, the progressives that he surrounded himself with are obsessed with ending global, you know, uh, oligarchy and kleptocracy that perhaps our sanctions policy would go, go into overdrive. Uh, so there's a real danger there because um, the fact of the matter is, is that our closest allies are sick and tired of our dollar, uh, our dollar privilege. Um, so uh, I think, you know, for, on the whole, yeah, I mean, sure, he'd be better than Biden. But, uh, it's, you know, I'll hold my nose and hold him. Yeah, well, the, I was going to say the other thing about Bernie is that one of the things that frustrates me, the corporate media bias against Bernie is just so blatant and so ridiculous that people often get kind of reflexively defensive and, and say that, you know, Bernie's, his supporters act as though he's totally perfect. And, and it's true that, you know, we spend a lot of time pushing back against the insane anti-Bernie hysteria in corporate media, but this is definitely one of his main weaknesses. And it's, it, what's interesting to me is that the president 
although in the U.S. the president has more and more powers with every administration, and you can thank George Bush Jr. and also Obama for drastically expanding executive privileges of the presidency, but at the same time, the most power that the president has is as commander-in-chief. And the irony is that Bernie, if he were to win, and it's, it's looking more and more unlikely, unfortunately, because you know, the entire DNC is against him, the corporate media and all these obstacles. If he were president, ironically, he would have the most influence over the issue that he kind of cares the least about. So I'm worried that if Bernie were to win, it would be a great thing for economic policy and many other progressive social issues. But I, I'm worried that he would kind of outsource a lot of his foreign policy to some people in his camp who, you know, we talked about people like Matt Duss and others. So for me, the most important thing about Bernie is not the obsession with him as a person, because even his supporters will often kind of fetishize him as a person, but rather the fact that as he has said in his campaign very clearly, that he would be the organizer in chief. And you know, that rhetoric's a little cheesy, but it's true that he has this, he has this worldview that in order to get most of his policies passed, he needs to have a massive grassroots campaign behind him and encourage activists and, and other non-state groups to try to play more, a more active role participatory role in politics. So I think that honestly, at the end of the day, even if Bernie had prioritized foreign policy more in order to get most of these anti-war policies and practices implemented, I think it would take a campaign, a grassroots campaign and rebuilding that kind of anti-war momentum that, you know, we talk about a lot has been totally decimated. And, and maybe James, while we're wrapping up, maybe can we talk a bit about the anti-war movement, um, not just Sanders, but kind of more broadly, because I think, honestly, one of the biggest death blows, death, the kind of death knell for the anti-war movement really was the election of Obama, because Obama did campaign saying he was going to end the war in Iraq and end the war in Afghanistan. And I think a lot of that momentum... And Trump as well. Um, you know, I mean, Obama did see a lot of social movements... Um, starting with Occupy and then Black Lives Matter, where unfulfilled promises led people into the streets to demand what they thought Obama was supposed to deliver. Where under Trump, social movements have been kind of subsumed by this phony corporate Democrat resistance, and people don't expect Trump to do anything, so they haven't come out. And I think, you know, under a Sanders presidency, you'll see a flourishing of, of social movements, either to defend his agenda or to demand that he live up to his promises. Yeah, I agree with Max. I think the best thing that could happen to reinvigorate the um, anti-war movement would be the dismantling or outright destruction of this phony uh, resistance, uh, which is really, when we look back on the Trump era, I, I really hope that um, a lot of these people, these resistance grifters, um, you know, feel, feel very ashamed of themselves. Um, because they uh, didn't do really anything constructive ex except the, uh, channel energy away from uh, legitimate objections to uh, the Trump administration. Uh, and it's not all well, not just not constructive, they've been attacking Trump from the right. They've been destructive. They've been more hawkish than Trump in foreign policy for the most part. Right. And so what they have to show for it is a failed impeachment uh, bid and... Um, uh, the, the the president's exoneration by Robert Mueller. So um, I think that, you know, the resistance is, um, I think it's disgraceful. I, I think it's deeply problematic, and I think it's been really destructive. And, um, and so, yeah, I think that, that once Trump leaves the scene, perhaps some of these people will regain their, their senses and, um, and begin to focus on uh, things that really matter, um, not these pretend Kremlin, um, what would you call them, conspiracy theories. And that's the danger of a Trump second term as well, is that they will continue to fester and maintain the face of the uh, fake opposition. So I think, a, uh, and then what Trump himself will do is extremely unpredictable and you can already see the danger of Trump through as the coronavirus descends on the country. So, I mean, I think, you know, there could be very dark days ahead if Biden is the nominee and proceeds to lose as we all expect to Trump. 
Yeah, James, we're going to wrap up in a second. I just have one final question. We didn't talk a lot about sanctions. You know, we were talking largely about kind of more conventional military warfare, but we've seen the growth under Bush Jr., Obama, and under Trump. We've seen just a skyrocketing of the imposition of U.S. sanctions on dozens of countries around the world and this form of economic warfare. And many, you know, kind of more centrist and right-wing Democrats have been advocating sanctions as an alter they call it an alternative to war. Uh, although many of us would say that actually they are not an alternative, they are a different form of war, they are economic war. So I'm wondering, you know, you said that you were, we would be worried that under a, a potential Sanders administration that the sanctions might continue even if the conventional military wars end. So I'm wondering at what you think, like how you think people can organize against the this sanctions kind of that this the normalization of this idea that sanctions are a preferable alternative to military invasion and do you think that there's been progress made maybe in circles inside dc or maybe in parts of the media pushing back against that oh uh, no i don't i've seen no evidence of that um, whatsoever and i i would expect that th that would be one of the um tools that um a sanders administration uh, prefers because it isn't outright um, military intervention. But I agree with your assessment that um, sanctions are by and large an instrument of war and they do terrible uh, damage to um, innocent civilians all around the world. Um, I think that the only hope uh, for us to sort of get away from our sanctions addiction is for our um, most valued allies to grow a backbone and start to start to hit back. And I think that you've seen some evidence of that happening uh, in France uh, and, in, and in Germany. Um, but outside of that, I think it was also sanctions as an issue is sort of too esoteric, I think, to organize sort of mass movement around. People just don't understand it. Um, so, um, no, I think that, you know, for the foreseeable future, we're going to uh, remain addicted to um, that instrument of uh, of not, uh, of warfare. Well, there's a lot more to discuss there, and hopefully we can have you back again, James. We were speaking with James Carden. He served as an advisor on Russia policy at the U.S. State Department, and he's a contributing writer to The Nation, and he also writes for a few other places. You can find some of his great articles also at The American Conservative. And then finally, um, I would highly recommend looking into the group he leads, because James is the executive editor for or at least the publication he edits, um, the American Committee for East-West Accord, which has a lot of really good content up on their website. So James, uh, while we conclude here, where can people find some, some of your writings and, and, and just follow you on social media or something? Well, I don't, they're going to have a hard time finding me on social media since I don't do it. Uh, but uh, uh, eastwestaccord.com is, is the website. Uh, we do a daily morning sort of uh, newsletter with a couple of articles that sort of um, go against the dominant, um, you know, bipartisan uh, pro Cold War consensus. And um, yeah, I'm sometimes at the Nation, sometimes at American Conservative, and um, that's about it. Great. Well, thanks so much, James. And you can support us at patreon.com slash moderate rebels. We're out.